Chapter 7 There's a wonderful tree at the curb of the bookstore that's probably been there for 70 years. If it wanted to talk, it could tell you stories of flappers and rockers, of Edsels and Ls, of radios playing on sweltering stoops when the voice of Sinatra was heard in the land and the Brooklyn Dodgers were whomping the Yanks. It might also inform you, though just in passing, that newer and better are not the same thing, and that stuff that comes later may not be improvements, and things that are newer may not be as nice. I've developed a fondness for Hunnaker's tree, and I've watched it deliver its annual message, the message that winter comes later than spring, and yet in the springtime it's loaded with blossoms, and here in the winter it's bare as a bone. It was starting to snow as I rounded the corner. Billowy flakes did a dance in the air, and the arms of my cherry tree seemed to reach out to them. Winter's blossoms, it welcomed them home. A larger blossom was perched on its branches. The idiot Wilmer, the Rex from Pearl. He was watching the doorway with riveted eyes, and he hadn't yet seen me. I you turned around and went in through the courtyard and cut to my sill. I stood for a moment and peered through the panes. A middle-aged customer paced on the desk. He was totally gray and exceedingly glossy. His ears were pointed, his eyes were green, and his coat was as smooth as a hummingbird's breast. The sum of his features, I thought, was Maltese, and he gave the impression of careful breeding, impeccable manners, and not much else. Around his neck was a lilac ribbon. I leapt to the blotter and said, What's up? He gave me the faintest of flickering smiles. Are you Sam, the detective? His accent was French, but it sounded authentic. I said, Either that or I'm robbing the bookstore. So what about you? Do I look like a robber? Mister, I said, It's two in the morning. It's cold as a witch, and I didn't invite you, and yet here you are. If I didn't think a robber, I'm not a detective. He thought it over. I see what you mean. Then start with, who are you? You're asking my name? That'll do for the moment. My name is Jean-Claude. He pronounced the thing Jean but he Englished the Claude. So how can I help you? He nodded and sat. He sat very nicely, arranging his body and folding his paws on the edge of the desk. The drift of his odor was heavily sweet, as though he'd been dabbling in scented litter or been in a room that had strangled on glade. It's a missing item he said, and then paused. I am here on the part of its rightful owner. I took in his hesitance, measured his paws, and then nodded politely. What item is that, and what owner is rightful? Be patient, monsieur. He tested my patience by clearing his throat, adjusting his ribbon and checking his feet. If you help me to find it, monsieur, I'm prepared to offer you five pounds of main lobster. Cooked to perfection, of course. Shelled. And with your personal choice of sauce. I looked at him blankly and said, Go on. May I now assume that I have your interest? Five pounds of lobster is a lot of lobster. 
I was hoping you'd see it like that, he agreed. He was nervously playing around with a pencil. He batted it roughly, or roughly for him, and it suddenly rattled itself to the floor. He looked embarrassed. He said, Forgive me, monsieur, and leapt to the carpet to get it. I looked at the window and studied the snow. He came up with a pistol, wearing the trigger like some kind of bracelet, and twirled it around. Its clear yellow barrel was loaded with ink. You will stare where you are, he said, sounding unhappy. Your paws will remain on the top of the desk. And then what'll happen? I stayed where I was with my paws on the blotter. He dove to the floor. I'll be searching your office to look for that. Sing. Well, I'll be a monkey. I looked at him laughing. All right, go on if it's giving you fun. Oh, it beats me, I said. Why you'd wait till I got here? A matter of timing. He poked through a bin. The deplorable weather. My trip was delayed, and I only just got here when, poof, you arrived. I don't ever arrive, I explained, in a poof. Why do you think that I've got it? I watched as he walked into Hunnaker's closet. It pays to make sure before spending one's lobster, he said from a shelf. He'd, of course, left the pistol on top of the blotter. I spun the thing slowly and pointed it left. He came out of the closet and found it precisely and perfectly aimed at the top of his bow. Now get yourself up here, I ordered, and start making logical noises and cutting the pap. Good heavens, he said. You don't have to get nasty. He trotted up quickly and leapt to the desk. As I noted before, I'd be happy to pay you that five pounds of lobster. Exactly, he said, for the speedy return of a certain kitten, an ebony kitten with emerald eyes. And who are you working for? Really, Morcia, I am not free to tell you. I shrugged. Up to you, but I don't take a case with my head in a bucket. I need information. Then let us just say that I work for the family. The kitten's family. You mean you're his father? Most certainly not. Then you work for his mother. Diable! Not her! I looked up at the doorway. And speak of the devil? She entered the room and then froze in the light. I gave her a wink and said, Welcome, Ms. Wonderful. May I present Mr... Oh, she said. Him. I watched their reactions. An icy coldness had taken the room down to twenty degrees. So you've made his acquaintance? Of course not, she said. Why, I've never seen this man in my life. I looked at the Frenchman. She's lying, he said. I looked back at Bridget. He's lying, she said. I grinned at them wolfishly. Man, you're a pair. <laughs>